morning, Christchurch Hillcrest. Good morning. Um, it's good to see the, n- the number that are here this morning. We come together to worship. We come together to be together, to enjoy fellowship, to worship <clears throat> God by our very presence, through our singing, through the preaching of the word, and just on our contemplations. Phil, last week, mentioned that there we were a a week into the new year and we had probably (coughs) trashed a large number of our New Year's resolutions. And that resonated with me because going into the new year, um, I was asked, have you made any New Year's resolutions? And um, the person who asked me that was a little horrified and I said, no, not a single one, because it's, it's a stupid, fruitless enterprise. And... Shortly after that, I came across, um, there's a, an Instagram site, if you want to call it, that I follow quite regularly, um, called Reformed Devotionals. And there was a quote from an American pastor by the name of Dustin Benj. And what he said was this, and for me, this is my resolution for 2023, because We are saved, we are brought together, we are covered by the the, the blood of Christ, and we have to grow in sanctification. But whether we like it or not, there's an onus on us as far as our sanctification goes. Um, It's not that we are saved by works, but we have to put work into it. We are called to work out our salvation in fear and trembling before God. So in 2023, my challenge to myself and to every one of you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is to determine to be men and women of the Bible. To hear the word. And if you can remember this, look up Jeremiah 3, verse 15. To read the word. Read a passage in Deuteronomy 17, 19. Study the word. Seriously, properly. Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. Memorize the word. Psalm 119, verse 11. Meditate on the word, Joshua 1 verse 8. And finally, obey the word, James 1 22. So that's my challenge to me. Um, and being the, the gold medal winning entrant in the World Procrastination Championships since the day I was born, um, this for me is a terrifying challenge. But with the help of those near and dear to me around me, um, and the grace of God, I know I will get there. Okay, please be seated. Angelique. Good morning, everyone. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise and worship you this morning. We come before you with joy and gladness. We are a God filled with love, grace, and compassion, and we humbly bow down in thankfulness. For without your love, we would be nothing. Without your grace and compassion, we would be heading straight down into the darkness. But you have saved us. You have sacrificed so much more than we can ever deserve. And we thank you, Lord. Father, we ask that you would draw us closer to you. Wash us clean with the blood of Jesus so that we may be reunited with you. Forgive us our sin and remove all our blemishes so that we may come boldly before you with confidence before our holy God. Guide us, Holy Spirit, so that we may know when we offend you, so that we can become acutely aware when we do this, when we do what is not pleasing in the eyes of our Lord. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all that is evil. Lord, we commit this new year and all we and all we have planned for 2023 in your hands. Help us to always trust in your ways, to know that no matter what life has in store for us, that you will work all things for the good of those who love you and who trust in you. Father, I pray for each and every member of this church family and their loved ones who may be experiencing some kind of difficulty, whether it be sickness, financial hardships, relationship problems, depression, fear, or even lack of faith. Fill us with your hope, joy, and peace as we trust in you in all circumstances. Where our plans are disrupted, 
give us the faith to listen to you, knowing that you have a greater purpose for our lives. Father, we thank you for caring for those in need. We ask you that you will please open our eyes to the material and spiritual needs of those around us and give us the courage and the know-how to respond. As we're at the start of a new school year, we pray for our children and grandchildren. You have given each and every one of us the responsibility to train, nurture, and teach these precious children that you have put in our care. Through us and with your constant guiding presence, you are raising up the next generation. Help us to be faithful in our calling, Lord. With our children, our toddlers, tweens, teens, or even lost young adults, guide us as we lead them to you and your plan for their lives. Lord, I pray for Jomo, Brenda, and their family. I pray for the various ministries of our church, and I ask for your blessing and guidance as we navigate <coughs> our way through keeping these ministries going. May your name be glorified through the dedicated work of all involved. I ask, my Father, that you will help us to switch our thoughts off from the rest of the world outside. Help us to focus on your word and help us to understand it and apply it in our daily lives. And forever glorify your name in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's reading is on um, page 1097 in the Bibles, and it's from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. The Fellowship of the Believers. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had these things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church family. Good morning. We're well this morning. Uh, it's great to see all of you back, and it's great to see many, especially of the teenagers I haven't seen for a while, and uh, it really is lovely to see all of you back. I'm going to pray, and we're going to go straight to the passage that Lorraine read for us. Father, as the year begins... And many things we hope to do for ourselves, for our children, at work. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us to not forget your plans for our lives, your will for our lives. And that in all that we do, we may factor ways of connecting and remain connected with our Lord and Saviour. Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this morning we, we're looking at Acts chapter 2, which again is one of those very, very familiar passages. Like last week we look at the prodigal son, and all of you knew that, that passage. Acts 2, it just reminds us of the very basic things in life about our Christian faith. This passage reminds us that just about any living thing grows. Any living thing grows. You know, we planted those trees along the driveway a couple of years ago. Uh, we had to support them with a stick and they're now big. And they're still growing. They're going to be bigger. Just look at your children. Huh? I mean, isn't that amazing? You know, the other day you were driving around to the kindergarten, preschool place to drop them. And they would cry their lungs out. And now 
they are at university, the young adults, they're working, you know, some of them are, are adults. They themselves have their own children. So I can say, look at your grandchildren. Oh, those adorable faces, aren't they? And the thing is, they change, huh? They change. Puppies, you see them. They're cute. They're little things. They're lovely. And week by week, you could see the change. And the same is true about our Christian faith. It is a living thing. It grows. Or when it stops growing, it begins to die. But it grows. It, 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 when we come to Christ, our faith is young. All right? We babies, we young Christians, we're excited about the fact that we've come to Jesus, we've put our faith in him. Like children, we then begin to grow in the grace of God and the love of God as we are taught more things about God. We learn more about his word. We learn more about him from his word. We learn more about what Jesus has done for us from his word. We, we, we learn more about sin and temptation. We learn more about anger and forgiveness. We learn a whole lot of doctrines about our Christian faith. And the more we learn, the more we grow. Isn't it? There are things that we used to appreciate when we were not Christians. When we came to Christ, it all changed. And I am hoping that your faith in Christ is growing because all of us have to keep growing in Christ. There will never be a time when we can stop growing, except on that day when he calls us home. Even those who are matured in Christ, those who, it's a dangerous expression, but I will use it and I will correct, I'll put some terms and conditions to it. Those who've been Christians for a long, long time, those who have matured in Christ, they are still growing in Christ. We as Christians, we are the student of the word. And we will always be learning new things as we grow in Christ. <laughs> and if your faith is not growing, if you're not experiencing the grace of God growing in you, the love of God growing in you, there is certainly something wrong with your faith. There's certainly something wrong with your faith. Huh? If you have a cute puppy at home, and six months later, it's still the same cute puppy, you have a problem, isn't it? Cuteness gets replaced by concern. I can't use the word worry. I said don't worry. All right, so I can't use the word. The concern is, hey, why Rover is not growing? Rob is supposed to, you know, I don't know if dogs have a chart, you know, but children do. You know, your child goes to the doctor, okay, he's here, okay, it's good. Next time he comes to the doctor, he's here, it's good. Everything is good. And you take the kid there, it's same. Six months later, same. A year later, same. And the doctor says there's something wrong. We need to investigate and find out why your child is not growing why your puppy is not growing right it's the most natural thing to do and that is exactly the case with your christian faith for some reason we come to the knowledge that we're actually not growing in christ that we're stagnating in our faith and but we just kind of like accept it and work with it there is nothing wrong. It's just that I'm not giving it the time it deserves. And I'm not doing it because one, two, three, four. And the fact of the matter, if that faith is not growing, that faith begins to die. 
Now, as a church, we have to grow in Christ. And the passage we're looking at this morning, Acts chapter 2, is such a beautiful passage. Here's this church that was devoted to the apostles' teaching. They devoted their Christian faith to their Christian faith. They wanted to grow, and they were doing everything in their power to grow in Christ. You notice they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which we would have as the New Testament teaching for us, because we have the New Testament, and the early church didn't have the New Testament. The apostles were teaching that which they had learned from Jesus, as well as the Old Testament. But Jesus had taught them how to apply the Old Testament in their context, in their lives. So this young church, we are told, it was devoted to the word, to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowship and service, to breaking of bread together as a church family, and to prayer. Everything below that is as a result of simply just this verse. They devoted themselves to the word of God. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to service, to breaking of bread and prayer. And this church was known for these things. It wasn't just a church that met on Sunday morning, sang songs and went home and lived their lives as if Christ had not touched them. This was a church that was committed to Christian growth. It was committed to Jesus. It was committed to the gospel proclamation to make sure that many sons and daughters who were lost came to faith through their ministries. They did everything in their power to grow in Christ. It was a small church. It was a house church. Surely it was also an imperfect church. All right? There could be more other things we could find out about the church that were weaknesses. But in the providence of God, this is what we are given and told about this church. It was a church devoted to Christian growth. They were not just going through religious motions. They were, not, they were seeking, genuinely seeking the will of God for their lives. There were struggles in the early church. We know that. If you ever studied church history, you would know that. But they devoted themselves to the brothers and sisters in Christ. And they committed to a life together. To loving one another. To supporting one another. To encouraging one another. And to live together as a church family. And the whole idea of breaking of bread, and obviously it changed with time, and the structure of the communion has changed significantly. I mean, you can even remember when you were young, or younger, whichever way you prefer. The way communion, the way communion was served is different to the way we're serving communion now. But in, the, in those days, really, the serving of communion, the Lord's Supper, was more like the lunch. Lunch time together. They would sit and they would eat and they, and, and they would do so in remembrance of Christ. And I love verse 47. It says, And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Day by day, the Lord added to, it, to their number those who were being saved. How wonderful is that? Hey. When you put it into context, this was kind of like the first church. All right? And from this little first church, 
other churches were planted. And today we have a global church. And I'm standing here and there are at least 200,000 other men and women standing like this in different pulpits throughout the world. And all started here. Just Christians who are devoted to, we want to grow. We want to know Jesus better. We want to serve him more. For God's glory and honor. And our context is really very different to, their, to theirs. We're not like the early church. But the fundamental principles of spiritual growth are exactly the same. Nothing has changed and nothing will ever change. All right? The first thing that we need to take and try and apply it to us today is the fact that they devoted themselves to the word of God. A church that does not have the word of God at the center is not a church. It might be a social club with a very famous public speaker whom they call the pastor. But without the word of God at the center of it, we can't be a church. But without the word, the word of God in your life, can you be a Christian? Can you genuinely say you, you are devoted to Jesus when you don't read the word of God? How would you know God better? How would you serve him more if you don't know his word? God speaks to us through his word. It is a living word and when we read it, we hear God speak to us. When it is being read here, we say, this is the word of God. Because when it is being read, we hear God speak to us. This early church understood this. They valued the word of God and they put it at the center of it. The word of God teaches us everything there is to know about God. I sometimes think we as Christians read more books about the Bible but not the Bible. It's not the way it's done. We are supposed to read the word and then complement it with the books that teach us about the word. Read the word. You know, this year you've got a novel, maybe that's sitting there on the bedside, but are you reading the word? Are you letting Siri read the word to you? Because again, these are tools we've got to use. Sink your teeth in the word of God and your faith will grow. Not to waste to it. The word of God is an unbreakable sword in the battle against Satan. If you know the word, you, you stand the chance to fight. It is a shield against all his wicked schemes. Get God's word in your life. And I know I'm talking to very, very busy people. But if you've removed the word of God in your life, you are committing spiritual suicide. You may still be alive, you may still be sustained by your Sunday school material. I mean, this is one ministry, by the way, which we may take for granted. You know, things we learn at Sunday school, we don't forget. A lot of what our parents teach us when, we, when we're teenagers, we forget. In fact, it doesn't even take five hours to forget it. And my dad says, um, did you do... And it's not that you deliberately chose to forget. You just forgot. 
Because maybe when dad was saying it, you were on the phone with her and you didn't listen to, or you didn't hear what dad was saying because she was on the other side of the phone. So we forget. But things we learn at Sunday school, we remember them. You know, and I get people who have not been to church for years. When we talk about the Bible, they would say, I vaguely remember this. When I was a kid, my parents used to take me to church. And this is what I learned. And we're now breathing a new generation that has been robbed of that opportunity. Because parents have neglected their primary responsibility of introducing the children to the word. Sink your teeth in the world. Without the Bible, there can be no genuine Christian growth. Acts 2 has taught us that. This church grew in numbers and grew spiritually. And this church expanded. And today we're part of that church. Number two, this church was committed to Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship. This is critical for you if you are to grow in Christ. This concept of, now I'm a Christian and I'm a solo soldier and I'm going to grow in Christ and I'm going to mature in Christ in my little corner in the bedroom somewhere. It is both unbiblical, ungodly and inconsistent with scripture. All right, you got to hear that. It is just not who we are in Christ. Remember the book of Hebrews? says, let us hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess. For, we who pro for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spare one another towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing it. But encouraging one another and all the more... As we see the day approaching. Christian fellowship is part of Christian life. It is something that God expects of all of us. Because we need one another in this journey of faith. It is long and sometimes it can be very difficult and sometimes it can be very lonely. We need one another. We need someone to say, how are you doing in your faith? Are you still having your quiet time? Are you still having devotions? Are you still reading the word of God? Are you still praying together as a family? Are you still in love with Jesus? We need other people to do that. And now and again, we also need to hear those gentle rebuke. Which is never nice, but it's important. You know, when someone's saying, you are honestly being ungodly here. It's not nice to hear it, but you need people to remind you of that. You know, the person has apologized a million times. Don't you think it's right for you to now let it go? For Christ has forgiven you. You know, we need that. We need it. So when people stop coming to church because they found the new preacher on TV, I mean, what church is that? I mean, I get people who were part of this church family before the hard lockdown, and then they haven't made it back. So whenever I meet them at the mall, they're like, yeah, we haven't been to church, but hey, we see you every Sunday. And I think, goodness me, I might have become a celebrity pastor somewhere. You know? Just now someone says, hey, that's him, it's a guy on TV. Never seen him in person. No, he's not even supposed to be on TV. And he's a very common fellow. You can see him on Sunday. He, he, he doesn't even have bodyguards. In fact, he wants to see you. Just come to church. You know? 
All the tools that God has provided for us as a church, we must use them. But the, the church is the gathering of God's people to hear the word of God, to encourage one another as we move forward and to cry together when some of our own faithful soldiers depart. That's church. Fellowship, Christian fellowship is central to our spiritual goal. God saved you and did not take you to heaven. Why? So you can wait for him to return. I mean, we're studying Revelation. We know he will come back. The question is, are we meant to fold our arms, wait for his return? No. He's placed us here so that we can serve him. And part of serving him is to serve his church. As a church family, God has brought us together for a purpose. And the purpose is to reach the world, is to reach our neighbors here in the upper highway, but also to encourage one another, isn't it? To keep going in our faith. It is in the church community where we are able to express Christ's love. It is the church fellowship like this that we are able to partner with places like Tolutando, because we are committed to Jesus and we are committed to the world, to the children that Jesus died for. We want them to experience the love of God and we're doing it together as a church family. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot grow. On your own. You cannot. It just can't happen. You need other people. You need other Christians. And the last one I want to, uh, the, the third one I want to f- focus on is prayer. Prayer. And I said the word is important because God speaks to us through his word. And prayer is important because we speak to him through prayer. Through prayer. And we don't need PhD in prayer um, to be able to pray. We just need to be able to speak. In fact, we don't even need to be able to speak. Because God can hear it from our own hearts. We need the will, the desire to come to God, to speak to him. And the modern church's biggest challenge is that we pray only when we are in trouble. When we are in trouble, we come to God and we pour our our hearts out because something we love, something we cherish so dearly is hurting or taken away from us or about to be taken away from us. And we pray earnestly. But outside of that, God never ever sees our faces. He never sees us on our knees. He never sees our heads bowed down. And genuinely communicating with him. Why? What happened to us? Prayer is a direct line to God. Prayer is a lifeblood of a healthy Christian and a healthy church. And prayer is the very thing that keeps us alive as Christians. We can come to our Father any time and talk to Him. And you think about it for you as a parent. And you have children who, like last week's passage, 
They only come to talk to you when they need something. Huh? If they don't need anything, they don't come to you. So when your son shows up and he says, Dad, you can honestly say, what do you want? <laughs> because there's something he wants. <laughs> but how wonderful it is. If your child coming to you and have a full-on conversation and even thank you for your support, for your encouragement, for always being there for her. I mean, by the, at the any time, you just you have to even hand your car keys to the kid. Because the relationship is strong, the relationship is genuine, the relationship is alive, and it is permeated with love, care, and support. We are a family. You know? We are a family. We love each other. We support each other. We love to do the very best thing for family members. And we do so not because we have to, but because we love to. And that's really what God is like. He wants to do things for us. He wants to do things with us. He wants to hear our prayers. He wants to communicate with us. Not those emergency prayers. Genuine prayers. Come to God in prayer. When you are on top of the mountain and you are tempted to beat your chest because, my goodness, Yom Kinto is going well. Bow your knees and say, Father, I don't deserve it. And I give glory to you. For it is you who has sustained this struggling family. When you are in a valley and things are tough and children are giving you the real hard time, which is a great privilege of being a parent, and I love it. I think it's really it's a great privilege. It helps us as parents to remain humble. To remember we are not the very best things in the world. We're not. You know, the kids can show you that. And at work, they might be scared because you're a boss, but your kids can. And I love it. Don't come to me for counseling. I'm just saying it. <laughs> but it's, the thing is, when it's down there, you pray. You ask for God's strength. You ask for God's patience. You ask for God's wisdom. And you come out on the other side. And you will still lead them as a godly parent. And they will always remember it. They may not agree with it, but they will always remember it. We went to a funeral up in the middle, in, up in Moy River. For a good friend who was here and he moved to that part of the world. At the memorial service, his son stood up. And he spoke about his dad. I think every dad who was there would have prayed that I wish my kids would remember me like this. And he wasn't a wealthy dad, but he invested his life in his kids. He loved them. He, he taught them the word of God. He, he encouraged them. He served them the best he could. And sometimes we as parents neglect our Christian duty when we think we're doing our children favor. We don't pray with them. Now and again, maybe we pray for them. But they've never ever had us praying for them with them. Are you still a Christian parent? Are you? Last one. It's service. Service. Serving one another. 
This church, if you notice, they served one another and they lived together. They even shared their possessions uh, with those who were in need. And then so often when we read that, we're like, no, 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 I don't want to be part of this church. But when you read the outpouring of the Holy Spirit before that and how those lives were transformed, revival was taking place right there and there. The Holy Spirit of God was moving and people were so focused on God and Jesus and not on their things, things that have captured our hearts. And so much so that we even find it difficult to serve in the church fellowship, to serve other Christians. And in so doing, we are not growing in Christ. Let me give you an example. How serving other people will help you grow. If you're a Bible study leader, you are serving the group by teaching them the word of God. And you learn by teaching them, isn't it? If you teach the Bible to the group, you learn more as you prepare and as you teach. They ask you more difficult questions. You go back and you learn more and you grow. So you're serving them, but you are actually growing spiritually. How on earth can you grow by serving at the door? How can you grow spiritually? By standing there and smiling at people when they come. Half of them are still trying to wake up. How can you grow? You grow by knowing people and their families. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, everybody knows my family here. You know everything about it. But isn't it wonderful when someone at the church and you come, Hello, Jomo. How are you? How's Brenda? And how are the girls? Huh? The person knows me, knows my family, and cares. And the more they share with you about their family, and the more you share with them, you get to know them better. And when you pray, you are able even to pray for their children by names. And that's how we grow. Every opportunity of serving in the church is an opportunity for your spiritual growth. Now, how is it that only 20% people are doing it? What happens to the other 80? What happened? How are we contributing to the function of the church? Let us cultivate the culture of serving one another, not because we have to, but because we find such joy in doing it. For we are serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I always say to, to, to the young ministers in these training workshops we run, there is something shocking about a lazy minister. Someone whose boss is Jesus, who laid down his life for him, and he made a decision that he would leave everything to serve him. And then he puts in as little as he can just to keep his job. It's like even godless accountants, you know, working for godless companies and bosses, they put in hours because they want the bonus. Or the motivation is bonus. How much more Jesus? Yeah. Then, then take it down to the Christian life. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and he sacrificed his life so that you may live forever, how much more would you want to serve that person? Shouldn't it be natural for all of us to want to serve Jesus for what he has done for us? Well, I'm a minister. I think it should. I think the Bible says we should. But I want you to think about it. As a church, I think there is so much stuff that we're doing right. A lot of stuff. 
that we're doing right. But there's so much room for growth. All right? We, we are on the path. We've got right emphasis on the word of God. We have right emphasis on fellowship. We have right emphasis on prayer. We have right emphasis on service. But we just need to up the game a bit and find ways of serving the Lord in our busy time. It's not all doom and gloom. There's so much stuff that the church is doing very well that as a minister sometimes I sit in my office and I can only praise the Lord for this church family and all that you do for one another here and for many, many other poor churches that sometimes I fail to bring back to you your acts of good deed. But there's so much more room for growth. One of our biggest challenge is the lack of devotion to our spiritual growth. And I'm sure if you are honest with yourself, it's one thing you have not set any goals on, many of you. How am I going to grow in Christ this year? Do you have anything like that? No. And that is an evidence of our lack of commitment to God's mission. But it can change. It's all within our power and it is all within our hands. We have no time in our hands because we've put things that we value in our hands. And when we say we don't have time for, to be able to do this, it's because we have filled our plates with things that take us away from God's mission. But it's in our hands to change it. Acts has taught us it can be done. So as a Christian, are you devoted to your spiritual growth? Are you still cultivating the land? Are you tilting it? watering it, so that you may grow in Christ. You're seeking avenues where you can serve in the kingdom. Are you actively participating in the kingdom of God? We are a body of Christ. You have one body consisting of many body parts, all of them have to function for the body to function. And all of us have to function for this body to function properly. Let's pray together. Yes, Father, we we bow our heads before you, our hearts before you, and you know exactly what fills those hearts. You know things that consume our minds. You know things that make us joyful, things that we pursue so relentlessly that we shouldn't be pursuing. We pray, Father, that you would touch our hearts this morning and that you would transform and renew our minds so that we may seek to honor you above all. In Jesus' name. Amen.